fifth grade, and welcome to the last history lecture of the year. Woohoo! Almost there. So, however long this video is, and then you're done. How exciting. All right, Napoleonic Wars. This is gonna get fun. Uh, okay, so first things first, it started in 1799 to 1815. You will notice 1799 is also the year that we said the French Revolution ended. Remember, the French Revolution ended because Napoleon came in with a militaristic regime, essentially, and military, and put himself in charge. So a few things to know about Napoleon. Uh, a couple of these aren't in your notes. They're just more fun facts. Uh, so first things first, he's actually Corsican. He's not French. So there you go. Corsica is an island in the Mediterranean. Um, it's in your Latin books. It's off of the coast of Italy. Corsica is over there. So he's kind of actually more of an Italian than anything else. But for some reason, he thought he got to take over France because why not? Uh, Corsica was at this time actually going for freedom. And then he had a falling out with one of the guys who was in charge of this movement. And so then he said, meh. I guess I can't really help Corsica because I'm not buddies with the leader of their revolution anymore. But France looks very available. Let's go take over that instead. So he did. Um, so in 1799, he seized power and set himself up as the consul of France, which is kind of like president in some ways. Basically, it's like president, although no one gets to check his power. In America, we have a president whose power is checked by... Congress, which is the Senate and the House of Representatives, on a lower level than that, well, and also um, also the Supreme Court, on a lower level than that, it's checked by state governments, as we are seeing currently, um, and on a lower level than that, it's, it's controlled by the governments of certain cities, uh, like our city council. Uh, however, our president currently is overriding states, um, states' ability to make their own decisions, which is a fantastic thing, because he is saying that uh, religious freedom is essential and therefore churches can go back to work and if you try to put anyone in jail you will have to call and talk to him personally which is pretty fantastic if i do say so um uh, anyways so 1799 he seizes um he seizes power and kind of sets himself up so now going back to the notes and we're going to go through those and i'll add some stuff in um so this was a series of conflicts the napoleonic wars uh, between france and many european countries uh, and it was actually the beginning of the move towards total war. Um, now, total war, I define in your notes for you as unrestricted warfare in weapons, uh, in the weapons used, in territory and people involved, and objectives pursued. Basically, before this point, there was a certain law code that applied when you went to war. For example, women and children, off limits. You don't touch them. Um, weapons you stay pretty, like, you have to fight against each other. You can't just, you know, go super, super long distance with stuff, like with missiles um, to kill people. It's up front. You have a risk of dying if you're in this war. Um, and then objectives pursued. This was kind of the start of wars for almost no reason at all, essentially, which have gotten out of hand. Um... So with that, when I'm saying unrestricted in weapons that are used, after this, after the Napoleonic Wars, warfare gets insane. And I mean insane. Because up until this point, you had cavalry, which was horses. You had some guns, but they weren't like the best. And you had cannons. And that was kind of it. After this, within 100 years of this, in World War I, you start having mustard gas which is a gas that you like put in a bomb, shoot it at them, and it just kills everybody, unless they have a gas mask. And were you at risk at all when you did this? No, because you could be like a mile away and shoot it and then boop, they're all gone. And so this is when warfare starts moving into really just ugly, ugly warfare. Um, the first example of ugly warfare after this, because this one stays fairly tame, not not super tame, but it's just fairly tame in terms of warfare. I mean, we are talking about war. Um, but the next one after this, where it just gets, it just gets bad, is the war between the states in 1850. Um, or sorry, 1860. I'm an idiot. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Brain flip. Um, so in 1860 to 1865, you have the war between the states. And that's where things get really, really brutal. I'm not sure if you cover it next year in sixth grade, but the war between the states 
is definitely, you can see a massive shift between the Napoleonic Wars and then the war between the states. And you see this massive change between where there are rules, where there used to be rules, and where there are no longer rules in warfare at all. Like, you can do whatever you want. Uh, best example of that in the war between the states is Sherman's March. I lived in the South for many years. You do not talk about Sherman ever because basically he spread out his men in a line that was that was a long line and he did what was called the march to the sea where they literally just walked in a straight line all the way through the south and burned everything which was total war because were those people fighting against him a lot of them know these were homes of innocent people and yet he burned them all down so this was where there was just a move from keeping things at least somewhat civil to just all out whatever it takes to win. Another very good example of this, World War II, the atomic bombs. We bombed Nagasaki um, and killed a lot of people. And guess what? Those people were not soldiers. Those were civilians. Um, so this is, Napoleonic Wars is a massive turning point between kind of this old world of age of exploration and medieval and code of conduct and code of chivalry to whatever it takes, essentially, in warfare. Um, okay, moving on. Um, I know, I'm sorry, that's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to go through. Um, but this will stay fairly tame, so that's good. Uh, okay, so this isn't in your notes, but in 1804, uh, Napoleon, sends him, sets, Napoleon sets himself up as emperor of France, which is funny considering he's Italian, if you remember that part. Um, now, with this, he starts doing something that is very interesting. He starts trying to basically set himself up almost as Caesar in terms of this giant empire where he takes over just all of Europe. And it's very interesting because someone else tries to do this about 200 years later. Well, wow. Numbers and Mrs. Straka's brain today, very bad. A hundred, a hundred and twenty years later, someone else tries to do the same thing. Hitler. Hitler does the exact same thing of trying to set up this empire that takes over all of Europe. And both of them do this. It's very interesting that they both have the same mindset. Coffee. Sorry. This is my llama mug. Um, okay. So he sets himself up as emperor. And even with, um, even with some of the symbols he's using as emperor, he's using the eagle from Rome. If you remember the Roman cohorts, they would have the golden eagle. Um, that would lead the cohort. He starts doing that, which is really, really, he just went all in on Rome. He really did. He just, he just went all in. Okay. Mm. All right. So the first campaign was called the War of the Second Coalition. You might be wondering, why is the first campaign the second coalition? And also, what is a coalition? These are excellent questions. Let me answer them. A coalition was basically like countries that were allied or united uh, against one person, Napoleon, um, the first coalition was actually led by the English to try and end the French Revolution. Um, so for a period of about 20 to 30 years, almost all of Europe just wanted France to stop, <laughs> just go away, basically, uh, because they saw what was going on with the French Revolution and they said, that is super wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. So we need to stop that now. And so the first coalition was actually people who were trying to end the French Revolution. And then Napoleon rose up and they thought, oh, this might be better. And then he started attacking everybody. Like he took Austria, because why not? Everyone always takes Austria. I don't know why. They just, poor Austria. They get beat up so badly. First first Napoleon and then Hitler. It's poor, poor Australia. Uh, wow, poor Austria. They just, they just get demolished every single time. They're placed very badly in the map of Europe for uh, not getting involved in wars. Um, but anyways, so he takes over Austria and they go, oh, no, 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 this is, this is almost worse. Uh, the French Revolution was bad, but this guy is also terrible. We need to stop this. So that is the second coalition, but it is the first campaign by Napoleon. So there you go. Um, so the first, co uh, or the second coalition, by the way, was Russia, Austria, Sweden, and England. Sweden, go Sweden. I will give you bonus points if you remember what lecture, um, here we go. Bonus points for Mrs. Straka. If you have your parent text, call, or email me, what other war we studied where Sweden got involved? All right. There we go. That's your bonus for the video. Ta-da. Um, 
So anyways, they got involved in this. Uh, they f mostly were fighting in northern Italy, which is mountains, not the greatest. Um, they were mostly fighting in northern Italy, and of course Bonaparte wins because he's, he's a man on a mission. Uh, so then 1805, like a year later, the War of the Third Coalition. And by the way, there are seven coalitions. Seven times that people ally against him. So basically... In the span of 1799 to 1815, there are seven wars that happen. That's that's like a war every year and a half. <laughs> it's just constant constant warfare in uh, in Europe for these these 16 years. Oh man, it would really stink to be in there at this point. Um, okay, so uh, then we have. Austria getting taken out. Poor Austria. Um, in 1805, the War of the Third Coalition, Bonaparte defeats Austria at the Battle of Ulm and at the Battle of Austerlitz. Um, and this was actually called the Battle of Three Emperors because of the people who were involved. People are texting me. This is... No. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> it was called the Battle of Three Emperors. And so Ulm, U-L-M, and Austerlitz are where Austria just gets off the map. Poor Austria. So by 1808, Napoleon basically just controls everything, which is just, I mean, I guess good for him. Uh, now a fun fact about things, because I have a few fun facts that I didn't put in the notes because it's the last lecture. We got to have some fun facts. Um, so apparently, according to records of people close to Napoleon, one of his habits, if he got frustrated, was he would mumble to himself or hum to himself or sing to himself which you wouldn't really expect that. You wouldn't really expect him to have that. Just, um, pardon, the English are moving us. <sighs> grumble, grumble, grumble. <sighs> okay, let's do it. Um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't expect that to happen. Um, but apparently he liked to do this. And on top of that, apparently, according to people close to Napoleon, he was a bit tone deaf. So it actually annoyed people a lot that he would get frustrated. And imagine he had to get frustrated often because, you know, people were constantly fighting him for 16 years. Uh, he was tone deaf. And so he would start singing or, or mumbling or, or humming to himself, but it was like totally out of key. It was, <laughs> All right, let's attack England. What? Is he okay? Um, so anyways, there you go. Fun factoid about him. Also, if you have heard of the Rosetta Stone, which I have mentioned, I've actually gotten to see it. It's currently in England because England, uh, spoiler, England eventually beats him and they steal a lot of his stuff, including the Rosetta Stone. Um, so in a campaign that he was running in 1799 when he first took power, he had some people uh, go into Egypt and start taking things from Egypt and attacking Egypt. Uh, and they found the Rosetta Stone. And if you don't know why the Rosetta Stone is so important, I will explain. Uh, it is a black stone that has uh, three languages on it. One is hieroglyphics uh, or hieroglyphs from Egypt. One of them is Demotic Egyptian, which is basically like colloquial Egyptian. Uh, and then it had Greek on it. And so because of this stone, uh, people were actually able to translate Egyptian hieroglyphics, uh, or hieroglyphs, I keep saying glyphics, um, hieroglyphs because of this stone. And without it, we probably would not have done, like maybe, people are smart. Maybe we would have gotten there, but it made it a lot easier. Uh, so the Rosetta Stone, it's actually not that big. It's, it's oh, well, you can't really see it because you're not here. Um, it's basically from like, well, here, I can, I can, hold on. We're going to sit up a little. It's basically from like the bottom of my torso to my head is about the height of it. It's, it's not super large. It's not this giant monolith that you're just, whoa. Um, it's actually pretty small. And it was just an edict that was written on it, a law that was written on it in three languages so that the people could understand it. And that happened to uh, be our key for translating Egyptian. So that's cool. Um, so anyways, there you go. Fun fact. Um, also, another fun fact about him, he carried poison on his person at all times, apparently, because if he was defeated in battle, he was going to just chug it because um, he didn't want to get captured. But we'll get to that in a minute because that gets interesting. Um, okay, so 
1808, he has all of Europe. However, he makes some very key mistakes. And those mistakes are, one, he, because he's taken over all of Europe, he makes his brother the king of Spain. Now, this is a terrible thing because his brother was not the smartest. And if you bring someone who is not from that country and you put them in charge of all of these people and he's stuck by himself, guess what? The people are going to revolt and take over. So he put his brother as king of Spain and immediately, boosh, revolt. It's over. Um, so he loses Spain, like almost immediately, which, you know, really is not the greatest. Uh, and then his other giant mistake is in 1812, he decides to try and attack Russia. I've talked about this in class before, why we don't attack Russia. Do you remember why we don't attack Russia? <laughs> uh, it's giant and a lot of it is frozen and winter is the worst. And so if you get stuck there in winter, oh, it is, it is gonna be very, very bad. Um, so in 1812, he attacks he attacks Russia. Now he succeeds in taking Moscow. Uh, Moscow falls, um, or Moscow rather, because it's, it is Russian. Uh, Moscow. Uh, he, he takes Moscow uh, in the Battle of Leipzig, um, but he is forced to retreat due to weather because it's winter. Now, guess what other very famous historical person decided to take over all of Europe and then decided to attack Russia and things went absolutely horrible for him. Hitler, that is correct. Um, now, on top of this, I don't have this in the notes, but when he attacks Russia, he is attacking Russia and then he is starting to retreat. However, England and Spain, because Spain, you know, has revolted against his brother, decide, hey, look, he's stuck in Siberia. I have an idea. Why don't we just close off the, the Western front against him so that he comes back to more people fighting him? That's a good idea. So they do that and it does not go well for him. In 1814 is the final nail in the coffin for him on this set of things. Um, he is defeated and has to abdicate, which means give up the throne. And he is banished to the island of Elba for 300 days. Now you might be saying 300 days, why 300 days? Well, that's because he escapes. And to help put this in a more visual way, I have done a Mrs. Straka drawing Quickly, hold on, I need a color that will show up. Um, I've done a quick Mrs. Straka drawing of a map of the world. Ta-da! Look, it's pretty. Um, okay, so with this map, I'm going to demonstrate why it was a terrible idea to send him to Elba. Let me see if I can make this obvious. Okay, France is right here. This is France. This is his happy place. This is the place we don't want him to get back to. Here, I need to prop this up. Actually, I need to close my window. Hold on, hold on. Ah, we need, we need the lighting to not be reflecting. Okay, so France, this is where we don't want him to get back to. Now, if you are a wise person, you are thinking, ah yes, we do not want him to get back to here. Therefore, let's put him like here, or like here, or maybe here, or over here in India. Let's stick him somewhere he can't get back. But guess where Elba is? Elba is right here. <laughs> now, it might be hard for you to see that dot. There's the dot. It is right next to Italy and France. It's right there. So of course he escapes within a year of being put there because you put him right next to France. Why would you do that? Um, so they do that, and that's ridiculous. Um, so he tries to return to power because he escapes, obviously. Um, and he tries to return to power, and he has what is called the Hundred Days Campaign. And the Hundred Days Campaign is basically where... I'm going to reopen my window slightly because my lighting got weird. There we go. Uh, the Hundred Days Campaign was basically about 100 days where he was rampaging around France, Italy, and Europe and then gets shut down at Waterloo. So let's talk about that. Um, Battle of Waterloo, 1815. It does not go well. Um, so basically with Waterloo, what essentially happened was he had his men all lined up and it had been raining heavily. So he has 72,000 men. Uh, England is gonna fight against him and they only have 68,000. 
And they're lined up, and this is in Belgium, by the way, <laughs> which makes total sense. England is fighting France with a Italian leader in Belgium. Um, so anyways, they're lined up on this battlefield in Belgium. Now, it has been raining heavily, and Napoleon decides, well, we have the upper hand. We have more people. We have 72,000. They only have 68,000. We've got 4,000 more guys who are disposable. Um, I know. Let's wait for the ground to dry so that they don't get bogged down in the mud marching across it to go attack the English. Now, you would think this sounds like a good idea, except England had sent out a help call to the Prussians, and the Prussians happened to show up then. Um, so Napoleon, instead of starting the battle at the very beginning of the day, waits until about noon to actually start this battle. And by noon, the Prussians had arrived to back up the English, and now the English have more people than the French. And so it creates a massive disaster. Napoleon is defeated very quickly, and according to reports, he rode away from the battlefield on his horse, crying. Um, so that's not great. After that, he is sent to St. Helena, where he does not escape from, and he dies in 1821, six years later, at the age of 51. Now, if you're wondering, why didn't he escape from St. Helena? He made it off of Elba very easily. <laughs> Visual demonstration time. St. Helena, this is our lovely map of Europe, and, you know, the world. St. Helena is right about here. <laughs> this is 1,200 miles to get back to France which is not gonna happen. So they finally learned their lesson to not put him, you know, right next to his country. Uh, and they stuck him in the middle of nowhere on a tiny little island off of Africa. And he did not escape from there <laughs> because that's what you should have done in the first place <laughs> if you wanted to get rid of a person. Now, when he died, uh, he was measured uh, by a French doctor. And this actually led to one of the most common myths, the most common myth about Napoleon, which is that he was very short. He was not. Um, so what happened was because of the revolution, France decided to change a lot of stuff about their country, including their system of measurement. So their measurement was now French units. And in French units, he was five foot two inches of French units. And the problem was nobody translated that to the equivalent of everybody else's system of measurement, like inches or the metric system. And so people just said, ah, he's five foot two. No, because when you translate it across, he was actually five seven, which at the time was an average height. Five seven is, um, if Mrs. Straka is standing, because Mrs. Straka is a ridiculous giant who's super tall because her family is all really tall. If you were standing next to me and you were five seven, you'd be about here. So Napoleon would be about this tall. Now that seems really short to you guys, but that's actually about average um, in, uh, in the world in a lot of places is 5'7". And the average height for women is 5'4". So I, I look like a giant next to an average woman. Um, because why not? Uh, <laughs> jeans. Okay, so... Oh yes, I was gonna tell you about the poison he keeps around his neck. Um, with the poison he keeps around his neck, he was going to, you know, off himself if he ever got captured, which he didn't do. Um, but he took this poison when he was on uh, the island of Elba. Wait, nope, St. Helena, I'm sorry. He took it when he was on St. Helena. Um, and the problem was he had had it for so long because he had had it for like 16 years at this point that its potency went down a lot. And so he took it and just ended up getting really sick and having a very unhappy time of it. And so that totally backfired on him. Another thing that is really quite ironic, um, very ironic, a famous quote by him was, never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake. Now this was a very famous quote and he thought himself very clever for saying it, but the irony is that's exactly what England did for him while he was making the mistake of waiting until noon. England did not interrupt him while he was making this mistake and it led to his absolute defeat. Um, final thing, because if you remember, and if you remember from our chant, our history chant, France was bankrupt after the revolution, Napoleon got a lot of money. How did he get this money? In 1803, he sold the Louisiana Purchase uh, to the United States for $15 million, which was for 503 million acres of territory. So that's like five zero three zero 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 zero. 
acres. So, you know, like all of America, basically. Um, so he sold all of that to us, uh, five, 503 million acres of territory, uh, for $15 million. And that is how he was able to fund all of these wars against seven different coalitions. How very fun. England was involved in basically every single coalition because England just really hates France. Like a lot. They, they really don't like France. They super didn't like Napoleon. He was the worst. Um, anyways, so he died uh, at the age of 51 in the year 1821 and thus ended Napoleon. And with Napoleon, thus ended a lot of the standards in terms of, um, of warfare, in terms of chivalry. A lot of that ended with Napoleon because everyone wanted more than anything else in the world. They just wanted Napoleon to not win and they did not want him to take over Europe. And then more than anything, Napoleon wanted all of Europe. And it meant that people started to just disregard standards of warfare, standards of chivalry for this reason. And that was the beginning of total war which was not a good, a good thing to transition into. And with that, the final history lecture of the year is done. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. Have fun on the quiz. It'll be, it'll be good stuff. Uh, oh, and the picture on your quiz this week is a fun picture. It is a very famous painting of Napoleon on his horse which is, it's, it's a pretty cool painting. Um, so that's on your quiz this week. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful week. I can't wait to see you on June 1st when we have our, our drop off and our awards. I will be giving out the, um, I'll be, I'll be handing out the awards and then I'll also be giving you all the calligraphy for this year. Hopefully you like it. It comes from one of our Psalms that we memorized. It actually comes from Psalm 112. Mm -hmm. um, so you guys will each get one of those that's framed on, uh, on June 1st. I hope you all have fun with this. It has been so wonderful teaching history this year. And yeah, I, I don't know any other way to end it besides that. All right. Have a good day. Make sure you help your parents with something today. <laughs>